Elizabeth Holmes was everything Silicon Valley and the media could hope for. A brilliant young female entrepreneur who dropped out of Stanford at the age of 19 to start a company called Theranos. Holmes went on the offensive, depicting herself as a Silicon Valley disruptor who had become the target of a smear campaign orchestrated by established interests. What do you think's going on here? This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world and the shadow lands where innovation, capitalism, and fraud sometimes get lost. Whenever there is a quote-unquote glass ceiling, there is an iron woman right behind it. <laughs> As I was reading the book and, and following the account, I mean, you know, the, the kind of feminist in me cropped up. I mean, like, because part of this, it just sounds like she is, you know, really working, like, I mean, in a a kind of old screwball comedy or something. She's a femme fatale who is, like, wrapping her you know, these guys around her finger. I mean, is that at that, work here? Or? That was definitely at work. And I know, you know, it's pretty controversial to, to say this uh, amid the Me Too movement, but, uh, you know, the 15 year history of the company shows that that is what she did over and over again. These older men, um, you know, she wrapped them around her finger. She made them uh, support her and believe in her. And I think she did it in part uh, with her intelligence. She's very uh, smart woman and she did it with her charm um you know she has these big blue eyes and she has this charisma and they were kind of taken in um and and you know it it ranges from channing robertson and don lucas at the beginning to uh, uh kissinger and then uh david boys and rupert murdoch at the end of the story this is a good time to bring up the press because so you know you have companies like walgreens buying in without doing due diligence uh, you have investors buying in without really understanding what's going on. You talk about how the first chief financial officer was like, you know, I don't really understand this and it doesn't seem to be working, but I guess it does. I mean, like there's that. The press was generally um, uncritical of her. Uh, and in many cases, they're the ones who kind of made her into an investment or, a, a, a you know, a Silicon Valley superstar. Why did the press buy in? Isn't the, I right. mean, the press is supposed to be the, the bulldog and the watchdog of right. democracy and of the market. Well, she worked the press expertly. I mean, one thing that should be noted is the first mainstream publication that put her on the map was my newspaper, the Wall Street Journal. The uh, editorial page of the journal did a, a friendly interview with her in its Saturday edition in a column called The Weekend Interview. And this was back in September of 2013. And it coincided with uh, the launch of uh, Theranos finger stick tests in Walgreens stores. And then the story, I would say, that really rocketed her to fame uh, about six or eight months later was the cover story in Fortune magazine that was published in June 2014. And she's shown, you know, with a black turtleneck and, and bright red lipstick. The headline, I think, is this CEO is out for blood. And that was a really arresting photo. And it really made her a celebrity in Silicon Valley and, and beyond. That said, I don't blame the press too much because people like Roger Parloff, who wrote that cover story, and then Ken Oletta, who wrote mm -hmm. uh, a long profile of Elizabeth Holmes six months later in The New Yorker, were outright lied to by her. I mean, um, you know, they, they were deceived. Oh, but I know you're a reporter, you know, when your mother tells you she loves you, you check it out. I mean, Ken Oletta fits into this, right. you know, old man kind right. of getting the... Uh, and, and Roger Perlo Parloff was a legal correspondent mm -hmm. for Fortune, and, and Ken Oletta writes mostly about media and technology, not healthcare. Right. Neither of them uh, had any expertise in, in medicine and certainly not laboratory science. Uh, Roger went and talked to all these uh, larger than life uh, board members and, and kind of used them to, to get corroboration that mm -hmm. from them that she was the real thing. And, and all he heard from them was, you know, gushing words of praise. Yeah, I mean, I guess that they were really deceived and they didn't necessarily go into those interviews and into those stories thinking that they should be on their guards mm. uh, about, you know, someone who was who was a patho pathological liar, which she was. Thank you, everyone. Elizabeth, thank you for for being with us. Uh, as you know, uh, Fortune went all in on the Theranos story. I mean, the, the notion that with a single pinprick you could get blood and do many dozens of blood tests at one time at a much lower cost was uh, compelling, uh, as it was obviously to your funders. We put you, on, I think we were the first magazine to put you on the cover. Uh, we even put you uh, last year on our business person of the year list, which will be 
uh, honoring you and others for tonight. So it was kind of a shock to us to, to discover a few weeks ago that you're really only doing one test with that pinprick. Do you think the hype, did we, let, did we both let the hype get ahead of the story if you're only doing one test? Well, let me, let me just start by saying, and, and I'll talk about that decision to transition our systems to the FDA framework, which led us right now, as of this moment, and for the last few weeks only, to run just one test in a minute. But I think you know, part of this is we've, we've looked at all of these articles over the course of the last couple of weeks, and I'm an engineer, and we've tried to approach this the way we approach everything, which is understanding you know, what was written, um, what's accurate, what's not accurate, and how did it happen? And, um, and, and so we went through these in detail, and we've seen that much of what has been written is not accurate. And so we've asked ourselves, what, what did we do to get into this kind of place in which we're reading this kind of stuff all over the national media? And what we've concluded from that is that we need to do a better job of communicating and we want to be the best at that. I mean, as you can tell from this coverage, I'm definitely not a PR person. And well, so, you know, we need to get that out there. And, and part of that was that, you know, we have not put into the public domain much of our technology and operations historically. We've talked about our work that we're doing on the policy front in the context of prevention and early detection, but we haven't talked about our devices and the fact we've developed hundreds of apps. Well, well I want to, and I want to come back to that, about putting the data and the information out in the public yeah. domain so people can really see what you're doing. But let's stick with the communications thing for, for yeah. a second, because I, I, I actually think you are an extraordinary communicator, and I want to show a clip we have from the TED uh, talk mm -hmm. that you did I don't know, nine months ago? Yeah. Let's just take a look at this clip and then, and then talk about it. Could yeah. we play the, uh, play the clip, please? We've made it possible to run comprehensive laboratory tests from a tiny sample or a few drops of blood that could be taken from a finger. And we've made it possible to eliminate the tubes and tubes of blood that traditionally have to be drawn from an arm and replaced it with the nanotainer. Ms. Holmes, welcome back to Mad Money. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I have to tell you, in all my years, I can't recall a private company that I have to candidly many have never heard of getting this kind of attention and scrutiny. What do you think is going on here? This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. There's no reason why these can't be distributed in, uh, in very, very decentralized locations. Your home? Yeah. You think people's homes should have these, uh, essentially a clinical laboratory in their own house? I think that's a very interesting space. Elizabeth Holmes wanted to be the new Steve Jobs. She even dressed like him, for goodness sake. And for a while, she fooled everyone, becoming the youngest self-made female billionaire in the world. Forbes, even, valued her at over four and a half billion dollars. She is the youngest self-made female billionaire in the world. Whenever there is a quote-unquote glass ceiling, there is an iron woman right behind him. <laughs> There was this woman, and they were calling her like the next Steve Jobs, the, St like the, the female Steve Jobs. She even dressed like him. She wore black turtlenecks. Really? Because when you see the amount of money that people invested into it, and then they're just shit out of luck. She went from being worth, I think she was worth something crazy, like the richest woman ever, or the, the richest self-made woman ever, something along those lines. I think she was worth like $34 billion at one point. Oh, she has a Twitter. Yeah, I use that, that one all the Richest time. Richest self-made woman worth four and a half billion. 2013, 2014, Elizabeth Holmes becomes a rock star. She is a legitimate healthcare rock star. If you've not seen this face before, um, I'm surprised. You probably are on Facebook too much, so please get off and look at your industry. Um, so Fortune, Inc., Wired, Forbes. Funny enough, one of, the, one of the best articles that emerged about Elizabeth Holmes, one of the most flattering, was from the Wall Street Journal. This is what happens when you work to change things. And 
First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. And um, I, I have to say, I, I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this. Her voice, her deep baritone voice, was that fake too? According to uh, my sources, uh, it was uh, an employee who joined the company in 2011, uh, had a meeting with her shortly after he joined, and um, it was late in the day, and, and uh, they were finishing up the meeting, and uh, she sort of um, expressed her excitement that he had recently joined, and as she got up, she forgot to put on the baritone and slipped back into a more natural-sounding young woman's voice. Was everything about Elizabeth Holmes a fraud? A lot of it was a lie. No, it hasn't. Well, if I use traditional words to describe what we're doing, it's hard because people then associate it with conventional processes for analyzing drugs and development or whatever yeah, aspects yeah. we may be applying our technology to. But no, it hasn't. Well, if I use traditional words. Holmes, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. This is Elizabeth Holmes, once the youngest female self-made billionaire, now facing up to 20 years in prison. It's a stunning fall from grace for the woman who was once poised to change the world. I saw her almost once a week, either gracing a magazine cover or attending a tech conference or a healthcare conference or going on TV. Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes. Thank you yeah, for having me. I am so incredibly humbled. We did this. You founded this company 12 years ago, right? Yeah. Tell them how old you were. I was 19. So many inside the walls of Theranos say they were too scared to speak up. But there was one unlikely whistleblower willing to take the risk, a research engineer named Tyler Schultz. He also happened to be the grandson of former Secretary of State George Schultz, a board member at Theranos. You also said that Ms. Holmes was manipulative. What do you mean by that? She's really good at telling you what you need to hear to keep going. She definitely did that a lot with my grandfather. She would just like feed him things that were just completely factually not true. People can come in and do full service laboratory testing with a stick from a finger, as opposed to having the tubes and tubes taken from your arm. Can you uh, recall any of the factually not true things that Ms. Holmes told you? The big ones are being able to run hundreds of blood tests from a single drop of blood. My grandfather would go get a Theranos test done and he would have a needle in his arm. You know, it's like, well, I thought this was a single drop of blood and there'd be some, you know, excuse about why they needed to take a venous draw for him, but, you know, for everybody else, it's a finger prick, and he continued to buy into that. They weren't even running most of the tests on the Theranos devices. While I was working there, we only ran seven tests on the Theranos devices. And most of the tests were being run on third-party machines. Did Ms. Holmes know at the time that Theranos could not do all those tests? She, yeah, she knew. But as Elizabeth herself once declared at a Forbes conference, she is not a woman who will go down without a fight. When you have that passion, you will get back up when you get knocked down. And you will get knocked down over and over and over and over again, and you win by getting back up. But I would start this company over 10,000 times if I had to.